until the past year, my programming skill set has mostly been in the realm of web dev, and I wanted to shift out of web development for a few reasons. One, I started finding other things more interesting. I took a bunch of computer organization and architecture classes at my college, and I really fell in love with them. Don't get me wrong, web development taught me how to use a lot of technologies, but how these technologies work is often abstracted away from developers. And I got to the point where I wasn't learning anything new by doing web dev. What made it difficult to shift from web dev to systems was that all of my projects were web dev and all of my work experience was also web dev. So how do I get a systems job with no systems experience? You could try and ask for that type of work at your current internship or job, but it's harder to control what you work on and you don't always have that opportunity. So what you can do is projects. What I did was I looked at the languages, concepts, and technologies that these systems programming roles were looking for. It was mainly C, C++, Go, networking, database concepts, and I did projects that incorporated these technologies. Having these projects on my resume opened a lot of doors for me, and I was fortunate enough to get a pretty cool internship as a production engineer at Meta. Basically, this role is a combination between a software and systems engineer. Who knows what I'll be working on, but I'm hoping I'll learn a lot. My first project I want to show you guys is the web crawler I wrote in Go. I wrote this code for a class for a homework assignment, but essentially a web crawler is a program that fetches web pages, parses through their content, and finds more web pages to crawl. Sometimes that's with the intent of extracting keywords from a website in order to make better search engines, that's what Google does. My web crawler did all of those things and then put the content of web pages into an inverted index table in MongoDB, which essentially just allows you to map a keyword to a particular URL and in that way you can search by keyword. So you can see here kind of the flow of this project. You start us at a specific URL, you put it in the queue and you're continuously popping from the queue, fetching that web page, parsing through its content, maybe inserting that into a database of some sort, and then you're looking for more websites to add to the queue and eventually crawl. This is what the search UI looks like in MongoDB. If you just put the data in there, it gives you this interface to search by keywords. So if I look up masters in computer science, all of these URLs will show up because they have that keyword match. I really enjoyed this project for a few reasons. First of all, there's lots of trade-offs to consider and areas to focus on, like what URL are you going to start with? What URL are you going to go to next? You could search in a BFS manner, in a DFS manner, or something else entirely. Mine uses breadth for search. There's also things like how do you crawl fast? Do you parse the whole web page? I only parse the first 500 tokens, but is that really a good indicator of the contents of a web page? I did the parsing using Go's standard library, which is why I think Go is a really good programming language to use for this type of project, because a lot of the things are already built into it. Also, to make the crawler more performant, I was able to write concurrent code where I split the program into stages that can run in parallel, and I used Go routines to take advantage of that concurrency and parallelism. And it also gave me the opportunity to perform some performance benchmarking with Go's time library. Another project I did is called Peer Notes. It's a peer-to-peer -peer note sharing platform for university students, and I worked on this project with a team. Peer-to-peer -peer is when resources are retrieved from peers rather than a central server. With this project, users are able to register their files to the platform, put filters on them like professor, class, subject, and then they can search for files using these filters. And we do have a central server that stores the metadata about the files, like the filters and the owner's IP address, but we're not actually storing the file itself. There are ways to do it without a central server, but it's more difficult. And then when you request a file, a TCP connection is formed between the owner and the requester, and then the data is sent over that connection. So this was a great project that taught me a lot about network programming. Network code in Python is 
pretty straightforward, and if you've never written it before, I advise that you do something like this. The next project I did was an HTTP server in C. Writing an HTTP server in C exposed me to a lot of things that writing one in a high level language did not. I learned how to use tools like CMake and Make. A lot of C projects I've worked on in the past have used these tools, but I've never been the one to set them up. So this project was a good opportunity to learn how to do that. I guess I didn't really learn how to use Make because CMake generates my Make file. And then also the same thing with Docker. I set up the Docker file from scratch to create a dev environment to compile my code and also the same environment to run my code. Let me just spin up the Docker container and call that. So now it's listening on a particular port. And if I do localhost 6969, I'm gonna get hello world. So it is making a request to that server. Uh, you see, we do get an error opening a file and that's because um, it's requesting a fav icon, but there's no fav icon on this HTTP server. That's my bad. You'll find out that writing HTTP from scratch is not that difficult. At least a simple version of it is not that difficult to do. It's basically just formatting, sending strings of text in a specific format. I really like that this has exposed me to some security things. So I encourage you guys to look at my code and flame me if it's not secure. I also got some experience navigating through man pages. They're really great and honestly more concise than ChatGPT. The networking part of this application is rather trivial. You just call like five syscalls and the OS does most of the work. And something unexpected that I learned was that I had to deal with signals. Signals are a form of inter-process communication and in the context of a web server, it comes up when you accept an incoming connection, you fork a child so you can handle that connection in the child and the server can keep running in the parent. And then once your connection closes and the child exits, the parent is responsible for cleaning it up. So the child will send a signal to the parent through the kernel telling it that it's finished. And then the parent should clean up that memory so we get our resources back. This is something that I never ran into while coding web servers in high level languages, but for some reason with C, this is like a concern. So it was interesting to figure out how to handle that and just learn something new. Now, if you really want to get low level, you need to go into the operating system. Like I said, do we really know what Accept is doing behind the scenes? Me personally, I wanna see what that function is doing line by line. What you can do is first learn some operating system concepts before you start looking at Linux kernel code. Really the best advice I have for this is to take a course on it. I haven't learned it any other way, but there's this toy operating system called XV6. That's pretty cool. People at MIT created it. My college's operating systems class uses it, so I'm a little biased. There's an x86 version that's no longer maintained, and there's also a RISC-V version that is currently maintained. My course uses the x86 version. So essentially what you can do with this is you can extend this toy OS. You can build your own copy on write forking can make your own kernel backtrace function. And it allows you to really dive into kernel coding, how it's vastly different from user space coding, and some of the painful yet really interesting things you run into while writing kernel code. And unfortunately, I can't show you the code for these things that I implemented, like copy and write forking because they're part of the course. Explore these things on your own. It's a really great environment to practice kernel programming. That's my two cents. I really believe doing these projects expanded my skill set and made me a better programmer. Also, putting them on my resume gave me opportunities other than web dev. Thank you so much. I hope this helped and subscribe for more videos.